So hi everybody, uh, this is the London Crujurian Meetup and um, today we have the pleasure to have Huey uh, that is going to present the data labin. Uh, it's a database, uh, like a data log database, uh, uh, which works uh, with a persistent and durable storage as well. Um, Huey is going gonna, is gonna to tell us more about you know, the journey that uh, led to this uh, database design and how it works and uh, the motivation behind uh, all, uh, um, all uh, the work is done. Huey has got uh, a small startup working on, uh, com um, on uh, chatbots, on uh, AI chatbots, and uh, he's uh, also published a number of uh, nice uh, closure uh, uh, libraries like uh, edit script to do the diff between the two data structures and uh, today is going to present us uh, this uh, data label. So hi Huey and uh, I think uh, I'll uh, leave it to you, you can share your screen. All right. Um, so thank you Bruno for the invitation and I'm happy to talk about uh, data living. So can we, can you see, can you guys see my screen now? Yes. All right. Okay, so let me start from the first page. Okay. So Data Living is a, a new data store. I actually recently developed in maybe three months old. <laughs> um, so maybe a little bit of uh, introduction about myself. Uh, my name is uh, Hua Hai Yang. So I'm the co-founder and the CTO of Juji. And uh, so Juji is a conversational AI company. So why do we uh, decided to build a, a database? So, um, so as you know, as a chatbot company, we have a platform for businesses to build chatbots on top of platform. So naturally, a lot of customers are asking us to say, okay, can you, can your chatbot uh, handle uh, data, you know, basically uh, query databases or maybe do some transaction, change a little bit in the database um, you, by using natural language conversation. So that's how we started to uh, get into the space of conversational data query. So this is a research area has been researched uh, for a long time in academia and uh, it's called NLDB. So personally, I have also been working in this space before, like almost 15 years ago, I published uh, and papers on reading, on doing natural language queries um, for XML database. Basically we extended X, X query to and build a conversational uh, interface on top of that. So from my experience, um, I feel like um, this NLDB space is more uh, of a data space problem than a natural language understanding problem. Um, so because uh, the kind of NLDB uh, conversation is very context sensitive. So for example, uh, in this particular use case, we can see here on the screenshot on the right. So basically first you upload a CSV file, for example, in this case, uh, car sales data. And then you are, our system will automatically generate uh, code so that you can uh, com make a conversation with the chatbot. So for example, in this case, uh, this user asks, okay, show me the cars under 35,000. Um, so that's, pretty ambig ambiguous, right? So what, what 35,000 means? So it didn't say it's price, but uh, from the data you can say, because you have a column says price, which has numbers like 35,000, 45,000 uh, in that kind of range. So that context will basically tells you what this, uh, how to interpret this user request. Of course for humans it's obvious, but for a computer to understand it's pretty difficult. Mm, but the data give you a lot of context. And the follow-up uh, queries, the user asks only the red ones. Okay, what, what the ones means? Of course, this means cars, right? 
So this uh, context is all come from the, I think most of the context, it can be inferred from the uh, CSV file you just uploaded. So that I think that's the reason why I think it's most of a database management question and then a natural language uh, understanding question. That's why uh, it's important to build um, databases that's suitable for this kind of work. That's the motivation for us to start to want to build a database. So in my opinion, Datalog uh, is the best target query language for NLDB um, because uh, Datalog is very declarative. So you don't have to tell how to do things. You just describe what you want. And also uh, particularly the, the flavor of Datalog uh, pioneered by uh, Datomic is very uh, composable. So it's a very nice language for um, computer to generate code for. So that's why I feel like uh, this is the best target language for uh, natural language database query. So we have also have other uh, needs for our database design goals. Um, for example, we want this database to be uh, in process, in, embedded in our applications. You don't have to start a different database to use it, or you have a, have a ops team to be able to manage this database. That will be create a lot too much overhead. And also in this particular database, we uh, normally care more about the reads because most of the time, yeah, uh, the user is doing queries, so the kind of uh, transaction will be less frequently happen. So especially in a conversation, you, you mostly you are just going to be querying, and only occasionally you may issue some 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 uh, request from okay, buy me a ticket or something. So that uh, happens very infrequently. So we care more about the bulk rights uh, performance instead of the random rights performance. So that's our performance requirement. Of course, we did, we would like to support multiple. DB paradigms, so not just uh, data log, so the key value um, database or document oriented database, as well as um, graph uh, database kind of query, we would like to support that because um, the user's data could be in different shapes. It could be in any one of those. Uh, of course, so to deploy in production, we want our system to be able to do data replications transparently so that we can Easily have multiple servers to serve our uh, requests. So that's our uh, database design goal. So in this example here on the right side, I show you. So this is the kind of data you can upload. It's just a CSV, CSV file. Maybe you can allocate uh, the columns. So for example, uh, which you can just use query data structure to, to to allocate the columns or maybe even the values. And then our system will automatically generate uh, the code so that you can issue uh, automatically generate this kind of queries, this data log queries on, on this. So for example, here you will find some kind of SKU of the cars and also display the models and the make. And we have some conditions. Here we say so we want to say car price is lower than 35,000. So all those are uh, generated from this uh, sentence. Okay, show me the cars under 35,000. It will generate a query like this. So in addition to our design goals of the database, we also have some, uh, would like to realize uh, design principles in terms of uh, simplicity. So we want our database to be simple to use so that uh, the database can be adopted by more people so that the more people using it, the more people are going to look at them and we can, um, this will be better debugged. Uh, so that's our motivation to share this uh, data naming to the public so that we can, uh, more people are using it. So we can, you know, the code quality can be better and more, uh, better debugged. Um, so we want this system to be simple to use. So we want it to be just a library so you can just add to your uh, dependencies and you can start coding. And also to support different kind of uh, DB paradigms. 
you, what you need to do is to load a different, uh, require a different uh, namespace. So it will get a different API. <coughs> so right now we support key value APIs and also data log APIs, but in the future versions, we will be supporting uh, graph and queries as well as uh, document oriented uh, uh, APIs. We also want the system to be simple to operate, so you don't need a DBA or a ops team to set up backup or recovery. And this recovery should be that simple. You should just restart your system. You should be, the DB should be come up right up. And also we would like the DB to be uh, in process, embedded use, so that there's no uh, maintenance threads or processes for compactions or other database maintenance work because this is an embedded DB. So we don't want to uh, staff your resources for your application. And also we don't uh, want people to have to do performance tuning to get a good performance uh, database. So those are uh, criteria for simple to operate. And of course, uh, we want the system to be able to scale uh, easily. You can just throw in more resources, maybe add more memories, or maybe add more machines. You should be able to uh, scale it up. So that's our design principles. Um, so, so we look around to say, okay, what are the options we already have? So the kind of requirement we, we listed above, uh, we don't have any existing database that uh, fulfills this requirement. But uh, some of them are closed. For example, data script, we find it's, uh, although it's uh, in memory only, it's not durable, but uh, it has a lot of uh, less properties that we're looking for. So it's a very uh, good baseline data log implementation. So the most attractive thing for me is the comprehensive test coverage. So you have a comprehensive integration tests. So uh, that can give us the confidence uh, in further develop the database, uh, knowing that uh, all our code is going to be, <laughs> because the test ensure that the code is correct. So, um, so that's very attractive for me. And also the code base is well written, well maintained. A lot of people have contributed to it. And has a similar API to the Datomic. So a lot of users are already familiar with this API. So, um, so that's a great plus. And of course, we have a very different goals in mind uh, compared with a lot of alternatives in this space. Actually, I counted the seven alternatives in this space, uh, Datomic-like uh, data log query engines in the career world, the seven of them. And so of course, so all seven of them have different goals. Uh, ours has a, a different goals from others as well. We are not interested in building a Datomic clone um, in fact, I will talk about later. Uh, I feel like uh, the atomic um, is design goal is, um, is at odds as, uh, with ours. Um, so our focus is on query performance, and uh, we don't care about the immutable database. We don't care about the database as a venue and such. And also, we have plans to go far beyond uh, an LDB. So because uh, our slogan for AI is uh, symbolic as a bones, machine learning as a flesh, that's how we build our system. So, and in my opinion, uh, the symbolic AI of the future is basically a graph database. So high performance graph database is going to be the basis of the symbolic AI for the future. That's why we'll, we'll keep involving this database to help with our vision. So let's, uh, spend a little bit of time why we don't care about immutable database and the database as a venue, all those virtuals that's excluded by Rich Hickey and also all those alternatives following that need. Mm, so in my view, uh, there's roles of database, there are two primary roles. The first role is uh, an operational database. Basically, the role of database here is to serve as a surrogate of the external world. So the, the asset transactional property of database um, proposed by Jim Gray, um, he motivated this asset um, transactional property based on British contract laws. But if you dig it deeper, the contract laws is also motivated by this uh, 
desire to simulate the world, the simulate the external world. So all this uh, uh, atomicities, consistencies, durability uh, is trying to simulate, is to maintain this illusion of external world because in the external world, if things happened, it, it's either happened or not happened, right? So it can't be half happened, and half not happened. So it always has to be autonomic. And also it has to be consistent, right? So it either happened or it not happened. So um, it can't be, so it happened to you, but it doesn't happen to me. So that's not, that's not possible in the uh, real world. And also the effect is always durable. If things happen, then it's happened. So you can't go against somebody's dead, then it's dead. So <laughs> you can't get it back. So, so um, all those asset requirements is actually is trying to simulate the external world. So that's the primary role of database uh, is to use the database as a surrogate of the external world. So your operation on database is as if you are operating on the representative of the external objects. So that's the primary use for, for databases. Actually, most of the use of database uh, today, like all your cloud applications um, is, is doing that. So that's necessary for most of use cases. And uh, the focus is on the present, okay? Yeah, dealing with uh, reality uh, represented in a database. So that's uh, traditionally called the online transac transactional processing, OTP. So that's the primary use. Of course, there's also very important, especially nowadays with social media and all that uh, big data. So it's become more, more and more important. The role of database as a recording of events or facts or things happened with your system. So that's the archival use of the database, um, which done learning requires assets. So eventual consistencies or base, so what is it called, is uh, sufficient because you are not trying to simulate the reality. So eventual consistency is, is totally fine. Um, so this kind of use is uh, important, but it's not necessary for all use cases. It's necessary for many use cases, for example, banks. So that's why uh, new bank bought the atomic. Uh, so because the bank requires this, but not everybody. And so the focus here is on prevalence and the history. So or for analytics, so for example, analytics processing, so we need this kind of database. So, um, of course, uh, I understand that people want to use a single database to do everything, So, but it's very difficult. So if you're trying to merge operational database and the archival database, and it's very difficult. Um, and also in terms of uh, the kind of API you provide is going to be more complex than it's necessary for many years. Um, because history has a lot more data than the present data. So you basically, you have to perform very well. Your system will be really fast to be able to um, perform to the people's expectation. And also you have more complex APIs. You have to deal with histories. You have to distinguish history and the present. So your API is going to be complex. And the most importantly, the kind of mental model you have, you require of people is going to be more comp complex because you have two more things to consider. So that means which hack is vocabulary, that's less simple. So you have more complex API. And if I'm a psychologist actually, I used to be trained as a psychologist because I care about um, how this impact on people. So people forget for a reason because in order to function normally, uh, you have to forget. Uh, so you have this very low forgetting curve. So you have to, as time goes by, you, the sense you can recall will be actually it goes down. That's uh, for you to function normally as a human being. And if you, you have, you, you don't, you cannot forget, then you actually it's like a painful condition. It's called hypersemia, uh, hypersemia. So it's pretty painful condition. You don't want to have that. Um, so basically just saying that, uh, these are trade-offs. So um, if your goal is to support operational database and the, your database should be stateful because in people's mind, external world is stateful, it's evolving, it's changing. And that's the reason why uh, we have been using Datomic for a long time. And uh, in our, we have many, many programmers, engineers and in our team. So the most common mistakes using Datomic is actually related to the uh, a wrong assumption of the time model. So people will say, okay, how can I get, 
how did I get this wrong data by using this query? So because you, you didn't think, okay, the history is also in there. And also people are surprised, okay, you have to sort by transaction ID to get the latest version. So if I forgot that, then I'll get something wrong. So, so a lot of mistake, mistakes are coming from actually the timing, time model of uh, an immutable database. So if, for data living, so basically we will forego all those transaction histories and we will not uh, build a immutable database. So data living is an operational database, so meant to be embedded in application to manage state, which is stateful. So here's the architecture of data living. So it's very simple. Um, at the bottom, you have this AMDB K value store as a storage. On top of that, we have uh, provide a thin layer of closure APIs for AMDB. And on top of that, of course, this is uh, already uh, usable as a K value store. So I will demonstrate uh, in a few minutes. On this K value store, you can build the EAV indexing processing for people who are not familiar with Datamic. Yeah, it's a data model of Datamic, basically it's a um, entity attributes and value. So that's how you will represent data. So um, the data living basically builds a EAV indexing on top of a K value store. And on top of that, you have the um, index access APIs and as well as data log query APIs. So it's a very simple architecture. So why we choose uh, AMDB? Um, it's called, uh, the full name is called Lightning Memory Mapped DB. So it's uh, actually uh, far, uh, fattest uh, K value store for read. Um, as far as I can, I can tell. Uh, it's a K value store. It's a support for asset transaction. Um, the DB is just a memory mapped file. So uh, AMDB doesn't have its own cache. It uses uh, operating systems, uh, file system cache. So it's called a one level uh, DB. So there's no other cache, but the file system cache. So managed by, by the OS. Uh, it's a B3. So of course it's optimized for read. Uh, so the write performance is not as well as uh, like a LSM like, like based database. But for large values, like uh, if you have values greater than two kilobytes, actually the performance is quite good. It's on par with those uh, write uh, optimized databases like RocksDB is almost a similar performance if you are writing large values. And the AMDB only works on bytes and you can support um, range query and the filtering and all that. And this has a unique feature which is uh, it support multiple independent tables so that, that you can put in different kind of index into different tables. So in AMDB it's called DBI. So each table is called a DBI. So um, on the right, we have some performance data. As you can see, uh, AMDB is far ahead of everyone else in terms of read uh, performance, in terms of write performance. So this is showing the uh, two kilobytes value. So that on par with other write optimized DB, like such as RocksDB and Level DB, almost similar performance. If we are writing kind of large values. So AMDB has quite uh, a few designs, quite I think will be familiar with people who are familiar with the design of Datomic. So for example, we know Datomic has a single transactor, right? So it's to ensure the consistencies. And this is the case with AMDB as well. So it has a single writer. So it can, it can be only one writer at a time. So there's a mutex um, uh, lock, mutex lock to control who can write. Um, both write and read uh, have to be performed in transactions. So even for read, you have to transact. And uh, the read transactions actually uh, don't block each other. There's no locks involved. Actually, there's a uh, reader table, but this reader's table doesn't have locks. So you can, um, uh, anybody, any thread can access to them without uh, blocking each other. So that uh, uh, the, 
the read performance is linearly scale uh, with the uh, number of uh, reader threads you have. So MDB performs uh, uh, many concurrent readers, so it does MVCC. So basically means that uh, it have different versions, so it's uh, different readers, maybe different reading different versions, but this version is consistent. It's, uh, and uh, it's, it, it does that by doing copy on write. So for example, on the right, uh, look at this graph. Uh, the top one is, uh, is a case where uh, you have two, uh, you have, uh, uh, basically MDB compared with uh, other MVCC, it is simplified because there's only two roots. Unlike many other like uh, MVCCs that's append only the keep all the roots and uh, just like in Clojure, basically all the versions are kept. In MDB, they only kept two versions. It serves as a kind of a double buffer, so you can switch back and forth. And so the, in the um, picture on top, so you have already written um, three pages, right? You have three data pages, and there are two B3 roots. So in the second graph, uh, so a new, new page is written, and the, the, the root, basically the root point to the, to, to the new page. And the, this, uh, the second the blue pages is actually now become a free page, could be eligible for rewritten, become obsolete. So this is very, a lot, looks a lot like uh, immutable data structure in Clojure. And, but the only difference is that the old pages is going to be uh, reclaimed so that uh, the stor storage doesn't grow in, in, indefinitely. So that's the design of AM, uh, AMDB. Uh, so it has enjoying a lot of benefits similar to kind of an immutable database, uh, uh, database, but it's uh, first focus here is on um, performance. So on top of that, uh, data living also does a few optimizations. Um, so we provide a read transaction pool, actually that's the code on the right. There's a, not a lot of code, just a little bit of code. Um, we provide a read transaction pool so that uh, all those, you don't have to create a new read transaction every time you want to read some data. So just save uh, allocation, uh, save um, of buffers as well as the transac transactions because transactions have to allocate some, some resources. Um, so that's the primary uh, optimization so we can reuse transaction. Of course, each transaction is normally, uh, once you obtain the transaction, as you can see, um, <coughs> the transaction is obtained by looking at the uh, thread ID. So each, basically each transaction is owned by a thread. Once, you, once a thread obtains a transaction, actually it keeps the transaction, uh, unless this transaction is uh, disposed. And so basically keep renewing. So every time, because you have the same ID, each thread gets the same, you always get the same, same transaction. So that uh, improves the performance. Uh, we have uh, one locks here, but uh, this is locks only for uh, sort of lock the uh, transaction pool. So when you, the first time you uh, thread trying to obtain a, a transaction, so, so lock it once and then in the future for subsequent years, you, you don't have to lock. Um, of course, we also uh, pre-allocate all those uh, off heap buffers in JVM because uh, uh, AMDB works over uh, like uh, bytes, basically. You know, we have uh, byte buffers. So you need three buffers, you need the write buffers. So each uh, DMB, basically each table needs one uh, write buffers because they may write different kind of data, different sizes. So you have allocated different sizes of the write buffer. And then each transaction actually uh, has its own read buffer as well as its uh, range query start buffer and end buffer. So you need three buffers for read uh, for each read transaction. Of course, we also uh, uh, auto resize the value buffers because the value can be a different size. So sometimes it will be overflow. We got a buffer overflow. We will then uh, catch that exception and we allocate a bigger buffer to, to accommodate that. Um, in MDB, so the key buffer size we fixed to be 511 bytes because uh, that's the key size limit of MDB 
if you want to change that, you have to recompile the, this code. So, but uh, we don't do that. Um, so the key buffer size is always always fixed. It's uh, 511 bytes. And also, IMDB requires you start out to specify total DB size, but as your DB grows, you need to uh, resize it. So, so data naming handles that for you automatically. So uh, on top of MDB, we provide a kind of a closures and uh, idiomatic uh, key value API. So if you are using some key value stores, um, so you, you might as well use can, uh, data naming because it's quite fast and performs well. And also you have already got a idiomatic uh, uh, closure API. So you can open a DB drop a table, clear table, or clear the data of the table. Or drop the table, and the transactions is done uh, through uh, uh, basically you transact k values as a batch in a vector. Basically, the vector of vectors. So each k value is a vector. So maybe I can actually show you, show you the code. So uh, let me re share this to a different so that we can see. Uh, I can do some live coding of the k values store. So you guys can see, uh, because this is on familiar APIs, unlike a uh, data log, most people here would probably already know data log, I will not show you that, but I do want to show the k new API. Um, so let me uh, create a new share, so if it's uh, going to work. Um, so do you guys see my new share? Do you see the Emacs screen? Okay, great. So I saw you uh, not loading ahead. Okay, so um, so as you can see, you just require MDB. So it's, uh, here we, we require um, MDB, that's the K-Venue API. And also require a bit. So that's where, because I'm going to demonstrate the uh, range filtering or filtering. So you need some kind of, uh, to, to process and read the bits to get the, Value in order to do fair tuning on them. So here is a simple API. Just open, uh, open the k value DB. You have to give a directory place, right? So where do I store? You want to store the data, for example. Uh, maybe I can put it in one. Um, so let me start to evaluate the things. So now we have a DB, and then you can define some tables because. Uh, so the k-value has to be stored in one of those uh, the tables. You can start, first you can define the table names so it will be some strings. So here we have a random table. We then have a date table. We will show the events of a day of the day, or basically today in history. So, um, and then you can open the tables. So open the table. Now you, you can see here's the transaction. So we basically transact a bunch of data here uh, in one go. Um, so this is a vector of vectors. So each vector is a data of a k value you want to trans transact. So here's a put. Put basically means okay, put in the k value, the table name and the key and the value. And the key, as you can see, could be just arbitrary career data structure, same as the value. So it can be arbitrary career data structure data structure. Uh, could be a map here, the key is a map, the value is a number. Um, here, key is a map, value is a number, so it's arbitrary data, you can just transact them. Um, and also the same transaction can, can transact to multiple tables at the same time. So here we are, we are transacting to random table. Mm, those are the transaction to the uh, data table. So here we basically, uh, the key is, uh, is an inst uh, instant, so here, because it's a, um, we, we want to do range query on this, so that's why I'm specifying a k uh, data type. So of course you can also specify the value data type, which is going to be a string, but it's optional. It's okay here. I don't care. So you can, you can specify the value data type as well. Or well, there's some of your other options that you can uh, ignore keys and such. I will not get into details, but that's a. Uh, um, transaction to database, basically you create some data structure and 
just transact. Okay, so let's transact this. So we almost instantly transacted. So now let's get some data back. So get value back key. So get the value. Uh, get the value. So, and of course you can delete the data. So delete is also through a transaction. It's called the DL keyword. So that data you just specify the keys you want to delete. So now it's deleted. Then if it's, now it's it's gone. So that data is gone. And so let, uh, now let me show you some range query. So basically range query is uh, you can specify a range from some um, data value to another data value um, by using some keywords. So from here, we want to specify a closed uh, range between Unix epoch time to, to present. So this is how you use a get range and in this data date table. And also here I specify the uh, data type of the, of the key, which is uh, instant. And uh, so, oh, oh, I didn't, uh, I don't think I, um, probably something, something is not right. And for the get range, blah, 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 event of the, oh, I know. So, um, so here I, I kind of specified the uh, wrong keys because uh, if you specify the keys, you, so, so for a table, you, you ideally you want the keys and the values will be of the similar type. So if you want to do range query, otherwise you will have trouble. Um, um, because range queries really require to know the data type to be able to properly give it a range. Otherwise you will get an unexpected order. So, um, so now you got, uh, uh, so those are the, yeah, from all the events between 1970 to, to present. And uh, so this is another uh, range queries. And this is at least 2000. So you want only events that's after 2000. And then here you want events that's before 1990. So, so as you can see, the range is specified by the, the keywords. Um, less than at least closed and all that and all. So all very easy to understand. And we can also do like a predicate fair filtering on the keys. So here we do, uh, in addition to range, we also do filtering by predicate. So here we specify predicate, we basically want to say, okay, is this key is a map or not? So we want to say, okay, we want to show me all the uh, keys that is a map. All those data that has a map as a key in the random table. Uh, so you get all those movies out. And you can also have some statistics you can collect with your data. So here it shows all the entries of the table uh, in the state table. And also here you can also show the, even for the range queries and the Fairton query, you can show the count. So, so this will be faster than actually do the actual uh, fair turning because actual fair turning I have to have to decode all those data but uh, here for the count you, you don't decode at all so this will be a little bit faster if you only care about the, the counts and um, you can use those counts um, functions which will, will be faster than if you actually get the data so here I'm getting all the uh, all the data in this uh, all those maps mm. So that's how, as, uh, as you can see, it's uh, very convenient to use for a career programmer uh, as a K value store. So if you are using, already using something like a Redis, uh, I can probably just can replace that. Um, and it's also is durable. Okay, so that's a K value API. So on top of the K value APIs, we built the um, data log uh, indexing processing based on this entity attribute value data model. So as I said, uh, uh, this EAV data model is very versatile. So you can use this to support a different kind of a DB paradigms. For example, you can easily treat this as a relational database because the entity you can, it's just a tuple, right? It's a, a tuple. It's just, you can, we can think of it as a table. So entity, a, a set of entity basically is a table. 
an attribute will be the columns and the value, of course, yeah, the value of the sales value. So let me go back to the uh, sharing to my slides so that you can uh, see, uh, go back to the slides, so go. Okay. Are you seeing the new ones? Are you, are we go back, back to slides? Yes? Are we back, back, back into slides? Yes, we can see the slides. Okay, okay, good. All right, thank you. Um, so as, uh, as already mentioned, you can support the relational data model with EAV and data model easily. And the graph model can also be supported. The entity are just nodes, right? Attributes are the edges. And the values, so if, it's a, uh, if the, uh, the value is a reference type, it's referring to a different load, so that's just the graph model, right? And of course, the, the CAV model is traditionally come from the RDF uh, triple store. So entity is just subject. Uh, those are semantic web people come up with this. And the attributes basically are predicate, and the value are the object. So as, as the same thing. And so as you can see, it's a very versatile uh, data model, can model a different kind of databases. So in this uh, vocabulary of uh, datamic, uh, this kind of a triple is called a datum. And so this, you, you, if you rank those uh, uh, different fields of this uh, datum differently, you will get different indexes. And so in data living, we store four type of indexes. We, we call this cover indexes because uh, the uh, data are just store the index as though other places for data. It's all, all the data are in the indexes. Oh, maybe it's an exception, we'll get, we'll get to that uh, in a few pages. So if you uh, have the EAV order uh, of those uh, fields, so E uh, at, at in front, attribute in, in the middle value uh, behind, so that basically is a row-oriented index. It's very similar to the relational model. And this is, uh, enabled for all datums. Uh, AEV index, which is a column oriented index, basically is attributes in front and then followed by entity ID. So that's a column, it's kind of like a column oriented store index. So this is also enabled for all the datum. datum. And uh, then you have this AVE uh, index. So attribute followed by value. So this is, uh, built to support uh, uh, attribute-based range queries. Uh, so this is enabled for all data, similar to uh, Datamic Cloud, but it's not the same as Datamic on-premise. Datamic on-premise, actually, you have to specify index uh, in your schema to be able to uh, have this index. And then we also have a VAE index. So this is only enabled for those reference-typed uh, uh, data. Um, so this kind of a graph in reverse index, you can graph load can point back to the parents. So this is enabled uh, in Datamic, but not in DataScript. DataScript doesn't have this. So this is our basic index structure. So index storage, we have two uh, level of index storage. One level is in memory. Um, so this is the same as that uh, DataScript. So we basically inherit Data scripts persistent sorted store uh, as a memory index. This is used as a cache. Uh, and of course, the permanent storage is on disk. So this is in bytes. So basically, we um, encode the datums into K values and put them in AMDB. Uh, as already mentioned, AMDB's key size is fixed at compile time. So it's only have 511 bytes. So we have to uh, manage that uh, with uh, with our um, uh, data stores. So the, a lot of work is uh, in that space is trying to make it work. Um, and we store each um, four types of different indexes in its own DBI, in its own table. So the key of the uh, tables basically are the, um, depends on the value, how big is the value of, the, of your data is. And if it's a small value, for example, the whole thing is less than 511 bytes, we will just encode the whole datum into, your, into the key. And if the 
value is big, so we will encode uh, part of the value and plus a hash, and so that we can have still have the same mm, support the run, correct range queries. But at the same time, we can we don't uh, overflow the the buffer. For values, actually, for those so the indexes, is uh, you only have eight bit eight bytes, and for small values, it's just a centennial long an integer basically zero, indicating okay this uh, is a small value. For large uh, values, so this long actually refers to a, a, a entry in a different table called the giant table. That table actually contains all the uh, four datums. And so look a little bit closer. So this is the details of the uh, layout of the disk format of the index, basically the 511 bytes key, how it's layout on disk. So the whole purpose is trying to make sure that uh, the, the, the order of the, key, of the keys show up um, by MDB is the same as order as if we show up in enclosure. So that's the whole purpose of this complicated encoding is to support that. Um, so from here, I show an example of AEV uh, index, so attribute in front. So attribute is actually as represented as an integer, it's a 32-bit uh, integer. And the entity ID is actually, um, oh, this is actually a, 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 AVE, uh, the, this graph is curvy, it's an AVE index. Entity ID is a, uh, is a long. Uh, the value then break down into uh, different parts. It depends on how big the value is. And uh, so all the values, no matter how big or large, you always have a header, which is a data type header. Um, so we support um, many different kinds of data types, int, long. ID, ID is also a long, but it's only positive. And also there's no header. Uh, other longs actually has its own header. Um, Boolean, float, double, bytes, bytes, keyword, symbol, instant, UUID. So most of the datamic uh, data types we support uh, with a few exceptions, um, perhaps we'll support in the future. Um, so the header is, uh, is one single byte. So we're using the disallowed bytes in UTF-8 character set to, to use those to, as a header so that it, we don't uh, confuse with any other values. Um, happen to be have enough uh, type uh, disallowed bytes for us to have to, to cover all those different types. Um, and then if you have a very large value, so we will basically first serialize it and then truncate it in, uh, to size, and then uh, followed by a truncator. This truncator, of course, is, is imagine it's going to be a, uh, it's a f f f f f. So that's a one byte f f f f um, uh, truncator. And then followed by a hash. This hash is uh, basically the closure hash, which is murmurs two, I think. It's, a, it's an integer. And then uh, the value and the, the other fields have to have used a separator to know what the, what the boundary between value and other, and either EID or AID. So the separator, as you can imagine, is going to be just a zero. That's a, a sing, single byte. So that's how uh, we represent uh, a datum key. Uh, in, a, uh, in an index. And as I already mentioned, if you have very large values, uh, more than 511 bytes, so we will basically have to store them, the whole data in a different uh, table. And this, this table is append only, so that uh, MDB has this append only mode where they just keep writing, the sequentially write the data, so that's very fast. So that's what we use for uh, this kind of a big values, we call it giant table. Uh, the keys here is basically it's auto increment long, and the value would be serialized for that data. Um, so for schema, we store basically in a different schema uh, table. The keys are the attribute names, so that's why we have limitations. Or you can't have a very long attribute more than uh, 511 bytes long uh, attribute. Um, I think most people don't have <laughs> that, that uh, kind of uh, keyword in closure, so it's okay. Um, the value would be a serialized closure map of the attribute properties, such as their IDs, their types, and some other information of the attributes. 
And so, of course, in the future, we will do kind of this. We can do a little bit simple schema migration right now. So, if we add a few key, add attribute, delete the attribute, and so on. But for the long travel ones where you have to look at the data to say if this is allowed or not, we'll have to do that in a later version. So, that's on the roadmap. So, so in terms of data queries, uh, we retain most uh, data script query logic, pretty much most of them. So uh, except a few, a few things we have, we don't support yet. Um, so the search uh, on, is basically the query is basically only search on disk uh, index. We actually don't, uh, when you do query, you don't look at the cache actually. And the cache is only for when you do transactions because uh, 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 the cache of norm normally only have the latest data, so if you just search in that, basically you make it, your logic more complicated. So we only search in on this index for query. And uh, we also have, uh, as I already mentioned, we have few indexes that's done uh, data script doesn't support, uh, or not, not for all the um, data. And, and also we, uh, merged a few pull requests that uh, data scripts for some reason refused to merge we actually merged them or oh, actually a few one of them is i submit one of the performance of the machine pr but it was not uh, merged yet and then but uh, in data naming we merged those so and the primary reason why data script in the bench uh, mark is slower than data naming is because uh, data script actually don't do uh, caches like we do in data naming. So we cache more aggressively uh, in data naming. So that's why most of the queries in the benchmark you can say we are faster. Um, basically we cache all the on disk on disk uh, index access API calls results in a LRU cache. Of course so we are not satisfied with the performance of the data uh, script uh, query engine yet, so because they are faster alternative, so we are going to move to those. And uh, the primary reason is that uh, the data script query engine is pretty simplistic in terms of query processing. It's only it only does hash joins, in fact, doesn't have any other optimization. So even for for hash joins, it doesn't do ob obvious optimizations like the. Uh, like you have to join on this smaller side of the table, but that's my, the PR I submitted, but it wasn't merged. Um, so there are better ways to do that, do the query, and um, basically it's uh, using the last state maps will uh, do a lot less work. So it'd be more performant. Actually, sometimes maybe orders magnitude faster. So this, which is actually what another alternative is called Asimi, Asami. Asami is a, a open source uh, graph data in memory graph data engine um, developed by um, Paula, I think, uh, from Cisco. So, so that's the engine actually I, we, we plan to move to in the future. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, transactions, uh, we pretty much retain all the data script transaction logic. Um, so of course here transaction we have a two step uh, transactions uh, instead. So first, uh, when you try to read something during a transaction, we'll search in the in memory cache first, and then search on the disk. So that's a little bit faster. And also we could keep all we keep growing the in memory cache. You uh, basically the same as data script. Um, um, but of course, this kind of cache will be lost when you, your DB restart. So the only thing remaining will be the on disk storage. So, so here the transaction is done in patch. So we collect all the transaction data and then commit them as a patch. And also um, uh, each transaction, because it has to sync to disk, so that uh, if you are just transact a few items or, or one data times so that's pretty slow. So because sync to disk is pretty slow, we all know that. Um, another thing we we did do is uh, after you uh, done a transaction, then all the uh, uh, cache has to be invalidated because uh, since we we have changed, so all the on disk index access cache has to be invalidated after your transaction. So. 
um, other things uh, is the same uh, as a data script, like the index access API is exactly the same as data script. Um, so the currently a few features are missing from data script, um, like the composite uh, tuples because it's uh, developed after I ported the uh, data script. So we have to add that later. And uh, also the um, transaction functions is right now not persisted because uh, convert a function into a <laughs> bytes uh, need some more work. So we'll have to do that later on. Um, and also we don't have features that makes, only make sense for an in-memory database like serial, DB serialization and pretty print. Because if you get with two gigabytes, how do you pretty print, print, print that? So <laughs> doesn't make any sense. So we don't have those features, um, but in the future, if people want it, maybe we can add. So that's our current uh, status. So let's look at the benchmark of data log queries and as well as transactions. So uh, as I said, our stated goal is to support bulk, uh, bulk writes, so which is uh, the goal seem to be achieved. So here, basically the data is 100K entities of random people. So each people, person will be a map. So we have 100K and, and maps like that. So if you transact them in one go, basically that's, uh, uh, if you try to load, uh, save them into a, into a, uh, onto disk in one go. So that's basically the init uh, bar shows. Uh, as you can see, actually you can do that within less, with less than one second. And if you, instead of uh, directly load the, the data, save, write the data, instead you write the data and then do transaction instead, uh, that will be a little bit slower because you have to go through the whole transaction, you have to ensure the integrity and all that. And so that will take about uh, a few seconds, so uh, three seconds or so. So it's also pretty fast. So basically the bulk write seems to be a rich dog goal, so it's pretty fast. And of course, you are, if you're writing uh, one data at that time, so this 100K, you will take a long time to write, almost um, 10 minutes or okay, almost. And so if you write five data at a time, it's also very slow. So I know if you try, so basically if you, just transacting a small amount of data is uh, it's slow because each transaction have to sync to disk, so it's take a long time. Uh, so advice is uh, you, you batch as much as possible data in one transaction. And uh, the bot, bot transaction performance is pretty good. Uh, so in terms of read, as we can see, um, we already mentioned the data needings and uh, faster across board than data script. It's kind of un counterintuitive because the data even is actually on disk, whereas the data script is uh, in memory. The primary reason I already mentioned is because we cache more aggressively. And the data script actually, they can do the same kind of cache, uh, but they choose not to do it uh, for some reason. Um, so this the kind of query, uh, data log queries uh, used is showing up on the left. As you can see, um, uh, for single clause queries, uh, even without cache, uh, data even is faster than data script. That means uh, the performance, the raw speed of the read of the index is pretty fast uh, in, in data even. The MDB is really fast. But then once you have multiple clauses and you start to do joins, then those uh, performance uh, will uh, kind of uh, overshadow the read speed. So that's the reason why we want to switch with a different uh, query engine. Um, okay, so that's the read speed. Um, and so some people also mentioned, okay, this is a single thread to read. What about the multiple thread read? So, okay, I just want to benchmark yesterday to try uh, using different number of readers read to, to read, to, to run the query, same kind of queries. As you can see that, uh, um, as MDB claimed that uh, the, the read performance does uh, uh, scale linearly by the number of uh, reader threads. So, and so on this computer, we have only six, uh, six cores. So, so as you can see, the number of threads uh, linearly scale up to six, uh, six uh, threads, and then they become dim diminish returns because uh, you don't have enough cores in the computer. So, um, but uh, before you have reached the number of calls, uh, this uh, scale is uh, linear. Uh, 
and the data need may actually able to keep the same claims. So as you have more number of uh, reader threads, you, the performance uh, number of read you can queries you can perform will just scale up linearly as your number of uh, uh, reader threads grows. Of course, per provided you have the enough cores to support that on your, on your machine. So that's about performance. Um, so in terms of the future, so we, in order for us to deploy our MDB capability in, into production, so we have to uh, reach at least uh, version 0 0.4 because we do need to finish the distributed mode uh, to be able to deploy to our production servers. So this distribution, uh, distributed mode basically is uh, data replication based on Raft. So that's what I'm working on right now. So hopefully we can quickly get it done so we can deploy it to production. Um, then after that, I will try to spend my effort to try to develop a new data query engines with uh, query optimizers to improve the performance. And then after that, there will be a, a little bit of work of uh, schema migration. And then I will, I will, then, I will try to reach uh, query parity with uh, data script, basically as a uh, composite and tuples and uh, uh, persisted uh, transaction functions. Um, so after that, I will implement uh, Loom graph protocol so that you can become a convenient uh, uh, graph database by using data naming. And so after that, so we will um, try to develop automatic indexing, indexing of document fields so that you can use this as a fast document store. Uh, so to reach um, point uh, version one, we'll hopefully get to materialize materialize the views and the incremental maintenance. After that, I think we'll consider that uh, version one. Okay, so that's the talk. Um, thank you. Um, if you have any question, I'm happy to answer.